Um, we have five uh, distinguished judges and, uh, um, you know, I think that was sort of one of the elements of mystery actually to some of the, well, to all of the contestants, you know, who are our judges. So I would like to introduce all five of them. The first we have uh, Nka Monyatsi from Botswana. Uh, welcome to Dragon's Lair. Uh, uh, Nka is currently the copyright administrator of Botswana, and she's been working in the field of intellectual property since 1997. And since uh, 2011, she's uh, focused on copyright. Uh, and we're also um, really pleased to have uh, Eri Prezetio from Indonesia. He's based in Jakarta in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the Republic of Indonesia, and he covers intellectual property and uh, tr trade disputes. And those of you might remember, he was also stationed in Geneva, and he was at one point the chair of the Asia Pacific Group. Uh, we also are uh, really happy to have Santiago Ceballos, the Director General of the Intellectual Property Office of Ecuador, uh, who's joining us. Um, he was also a vice president or vice chair of the WIPO SCCR committee, I believe between uh, yeah July 2015 to December 2016. And he was the lead delegate for Ecuador at uh, the Marrakesh Treaty for the Blind uh, Negotiations. And uh, we have uh, Luis Villarroel uh, from um, Santiago, Chile. He's the director of Innovarte. Uh, Luis Villarroel was a former judge at the Intellectual Property Court of Chile. Uh, he was an advisor to the Ministry of the Education of Chile from 2003 to 2008. He, uh, for those of you who don't know, he introduced the copyright limitations and exceptions agenda uh, to WIPO in 2004. And he also represented uh, Ecuador at the Marrakesh Diplomatic Conference. And last but not least, we have Anna Vupola from Finland. She's a ministerial advisor at the Ministry of Education and Culture in Finland. Um, and now I'll introduce our eight contestants. Um, the first is Alan Roca. The second is James Love. The third is uh, Teresa Nobre. Uh, the fourth contestant is Stephen Weiber. Uh, the fifth contestant is Sean Flynn, uh, then followed by Jonathan Band, and then Teresa Hackett, and then Jean Dryden. And just to put, before we start the pitches and Ellen goes first, just to put things into con context, um, you know, next week we have uh, the 40th session of the SCCR and, you know, we're in a changed world with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic raging uh, across the world. Uh, WIPO is under new leadership, under the leadership of uh, Darren Tang since October uh, 1st. And the purpose of this exercise is to think of creative new ideas for the work program of uh, WIPO's Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights over the next two to three years. And just for some additional context, while we have this exercise right now, the current chair, I believe his name is Aziz uh, Deng from Senegal of the Standing Committee on Copyright is meeting with regional coordinators right now to uh, discuss the annotated agenda for uh, uh, next week's uh, program. So let's start with the pitches. So um, we'll have a strict um, you know, stopwatch. I will start with um, Alan, uh, please unmute yourself and go ahead and pitch. Just a minute, yeah, okay. Should I start now then? Yes, please, go ahead. All right, uh, for, good morning and thank you, thank you all for participating and the, for the opportunity. Well, I'm gonna talk about the, the access to culture for the people with disabilities. And I will start from take from the Marrakesh Treaty. The Marrakesh Treaty is very closely linked to the UN uh, Convention for the People with Disability 
for the promotion of the rights of people with disability. And it was one of the greatest, if not the greatest achievement of the outgoing DJ. Actually, his own words, that was the biggest uh, achievement that he achieved, he arrived at uh, throughout his mandate. And uh, although it was a great advancement, uh, it's still inc an incomplete one. It's an incomplete one for two reasons. And uh, for one of the reasons, um, it uh, cuts short on providing access to culture to people with visual uh, disabilities to other material, other, to material other than the text ones. So as for the Marrakesh Treaty, the people with visual disabilities only have access in accessible format uh, to text material. Uh, on the other hand, it also cuts short on, stops short of actually enabling access to culture and the full participation in the cultural life of people with other disabilities. So um, if we take the Marrakesh Treaty just by itself, in fact, although it promotes the inclusion of people with visual disabilities in, in terms of access to text material, it excludes all other uh, people with disabilities of having the same and equivalent access, creating a distinction uh, within uh, the group of people with disabilities, all of which are not going to be uh, their desires and their wishes and their needs, their cultural needs are not going to be fulfilled by uh, the right holders for the same reasons why the people with visual disabilities were not, for lack of commercial interest. So uh, my proposal, very objectively, is to expand, to keep moving forward in terms of providing access to people with disabilities for which there's no, not really a market for them, uh, and expand them beyond the people with visual disabilities to people with other disabilities. And in that sense, really completing the job of uh, fulfilling and moving forward the UN Convention of the rights of people with disabilities. Uh, that proposal does fit the development agenda, does fit the line and the arguments that went through with the Marrakesh Treaty. So it's basically a follow-up from the Marrakesh Treaty. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Alan. You actually had uh, six more seconds, so good job. Uh, and that's exactly the model that everyone should Follow. So let me reset the clock. And Jamie, would you unmute yourself and also, um, yeah. So Jamie, when you're ready, please pitch, and I'll start when you speak. Unlike other presenters today, I will not be focusing on issues relating to rights or exceptions to rights, two areas that have often divided the SSCR members. I propose the SSCR have a permanent agenda item on transparency. Within this agenda item, the SSCR should examine issues related to transparency and eventually consider soft norms to enhance transparency of the copyright system. One additional aspect, which can be discussed as a matter of transparency, but could also be a separate agenda item, would be the metadata for copyrighted works, starting with recorded music. Why do I think transparency is important? For starters, because there is too little transparency. Does anyone at WIPER really know how the copyright system distributes income between authors or performers and publishers, broadcasters, or other right holders? Or how money flows between countries or the impact of extended copyright terms on incomes and access? What are the changes in identifying uh, I'm sorry, what are the challenges in identifying rights holders for works, including photographs or works not in commerce? And how do contracts look like between publishers and libraries or journalists and their employers? With regard to metadata, there has been a significant decrease in the information available to listeners of music. As we no longer use vinyl albums with artwork on liner notes and liner notes to communicate the dates of performances, the names of musicians, and often even the authors of the music. There are good examples of metadata for stream music and some appalling examples, sometimes on the same platforms. Knowing why this is and identifying best practices 
and possible issues about standards and interoperability for databases of such data would be a good use of the SSCR's time. Instead of fights between publishers and user groups, the SSCR could focus on making the copyright system work better for authors, performers, and listeners, the three most important stakeholders. Finally, I think that transparency is becoming a core issue in protecting society from the growing use of propaganda and false narratives to manipulate policy outcomes. We should support efforts to have more evidence and more facts before policies are shaped. Post-truth politics is a political culture in which debate is framed largely by appeals to emotion disconnected from the facts or details of policy. WIPO can pivot to more facts, more truth by adopting an agenda item on transparency and by doing so, make the copyright system work better for society. Thank you. Just under three minutes, uh, Jamie, 2.59. And now uh, let me reset the clock. Uh, and now, um, Teresa, uh, I'm gonna ask you to unmute please. And I will press hit play when you start pitching. So please go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Theo. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna focus on a contentious subject, which is education. Uh, the COVID pandemic has caused a massive disruption of the normal organization of education. With schools forced into closure overnight, the education community had to adapt quickly. Classes went live online or started being pre-recorded with teachers using email, clouds, and chats to share materials with students. Before the pandemic, we were already seeing a trend, a trend towards digital and online education. And in a few months, this became the new normal with institutions all over the world opting for a remote teaching format or hybrid model of in-person and online. And we may never go back to the way things were. And this means that our calls to support at the international level the convergence of the national copyright frameworks for education can no longer be dismissed. The education exceptions that exist today in many countries all over the world have no elasticity to cover activities that take place remotely. And from the point of view of educators and learners, they are performing online activities that are equivalent to those conducted in an analog, analog setting. But from a copyright perspective, these activities are not the same. They trigger different exclusive rights. They require exceptions that are technology neutral and that are not limited to certain venues such as classrooms. So in other words, our education communities today are basically relying on right holders not enforcing their rights, which is unsustainable on the long term. Um, we need action from policymakers, and, and this action needs to be taken now. We believe the same way WIPO, we impose, you know, the treaties impose on WIPO members the protection of exclusive rights. We should impose on them the protection of education as an exception to copyright, but we propose to set priorities. So, so far we have been trying to harmonize and discuss harmonization of education exceptions. And what we propose now is that the CCR, SCCR should focus first on doing normative work towards the adoption of an international instrument to solve the cross-border aspects of these activities. And this means, you know, we know it, with education being primarily conducted online, at least at a higher level, education level, and with a huge amount of teachers and students of the same institution located in their homes, in different countries and crossing borders virtually to, to, to conduct their daily activities, we need to decide which national exception will apply to their activities. And no single country can make that decision alone. So the Sorry, Teresa, your time is up. One second, can I yes. just to finish? We need a super national instrument can be inspired by the cross-border provisions of the Marrakesh of the new copyright directive and should be applicable subject to certain conditions, such as required the applicable exception to respect the treaties and the three step test. And that's all. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry. Um, okay, uh, I have to reset 
the clock. Uh, one, all right. Um, so the next speaker is Stephen, uh, and it'll be three minutes, Stephen, and I'm about to hit press play. So go ahead, pitch. So thank you, and I want to warn everyone at the beginning that being English, being excited and visionary doesn't come naturally to me, so I hope this all doesn't sound too odd. But I want you to imagine the world in five years' time, to think beyond, just for a moment, all that's going, going on around us today. What does this world look like? We certainly haven't returned to normal. The importance, the magic even, of being with a teacher, a colleague, a librarian, of being in the presence of a work of art, a book, none of this has diminished. But we also see how much can be done digitally and seize the possibilities fully to enable education, research and access to heritage. Meanwhile, despite reduced travel, climate change is clearly with us to stay for the foreseeable future. Extreme weather events have intensified, threatening much of our heritage, especially in small island developing states. Yet when a storm, a fire or another disaster strikes, all is not lost because we will have enabled heritage institutions to work together to share their equipment, their expertise, to digitize their collections, to store them safely, and to provide controlled access to them for public interest purposes, just as they have long done in person. And how is this possible? Because WIPO has taken action, has just celebrated the pack passage of a Marrakesh Treaty for the memory of the world. There is consensus, not just because of the need to safeguard heritage in the face of climate change, but also because governments of richer countries those whose citizens don't struggle to get visas to pay for travel have now understood, thanks to COVID, what it looks like when there isn't the possibility to consult with the heritage of humanity in other cities, in other countries, in person. To draw on it to support research, education and understanding between peoples. Such a treaty has been recognised as not only essential to bringing about change in national laws, to supporting efforts to safeguard heritage education and research and understanding between peoples without causing undue harm to right holders. Not only because such a treaty offers invaluable guidance and security for governments to be certain in what they are doing, but also because it is the only way to ensure that heritage institutions can work together to deliver. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. That was uh, well under time. Our next contestant will be Sean Flynn. And I understand, Sean, that, oh, yes. So, um, Sean, when you're ready, uh, please pitch. Sean, we can see your screen. Sorry, all. Um, so the coronavirus was not discovered by the World Health Organization or the CDC or even the CIA. It was discovered by a text and data mining company producing and reading copyrighted news articles and other sources as permitted under Canada's broad research exception that permits such uses. Human rights law gives us all the right to receive and impart information to enjoy and access education and culture while protecting the moral and material rights of authors. These values and norms are paramount and we must implement copyright law to promote those ends. Unfortunately, our dated global system does not prioritize these human rights. This is a map of the world based on whether countries currently provide the full scope of rights needed to produce and share research in the digital environment. Only the green countries fully provide those rights. A similar map could be created on the inadequacy of current educational exceptions for sharing materials in the same digital environment. The international treaty context does not require any of the restrictions on digital learning and research that exist, but we don't have time to pass a new treaty requiring their reversal. The Doha Declaration on TRIPS and Public Health provides an answer for what we can do urgently in this context. The Doha Declaration largely does not amend the international treaty environment. It defines and clarifies and promotes the flexibilities that exist and it worked. The success in globalizing treatment for AIDS under the Doha Declaration can be expanded to the context of COVID and access to knowledge. And therefore my proposal is that we should recognize the problem and stress the need for action 
We can agree the terms in the international treaty like Article 10.2's reference to teaching can include online activities. We can reaffirm that flexibility, indeed a human rights duty to interpret out of date terms like reproduction of face-to-face, -face, photocopy, reprography, apply in the digital environment now to be functional and representative not confining. We can instruct the SCCR Secretariat to draft and study solutions to these problems, and we can reaffirm the commitment of developed countries to help. The fine details of these norms can be settled by delegates at the next SCCR, but I call on the next SCCR to take this action, to pledge to move forward on an agenda for a Doha Declaration for Access to Knowledge during COVID. Thanks, John. Um, and let me reset the clock. And our next contestant will be Jonathan Bend. Uh, Jonathan, whenever you're ready. Hi. My proposal is that the SECR authorize the creation of a model provision on the preservation of cultural heritage. I agree with Stephen that there is a consensus on preservation and a need to proceed to a treaty addressing the preservation issue. However, because of COVID, normative work might not occur in SCCR for a year or longer. And once normative work begins, it might take a while to reach a final result. And then the treaty would need to be domesticated. In the interim, significant amounts of cultural heritage could be lost. What I suggest is that in the interim, SCCR undertake uh, work on a model preservation, a model provision for preservation, specifically this SCCR should direct the Secretariat to retain an expert, perhaps Kenny Cruz, who has performed several studies on library exceptions for SCCR, to provide, uh, to prepare a model preservation provision after consultation with all stakeholders. This provision could easily uh, be completed by the ne next SCCR, by SCCR 41. The provision would just, would need just four, three elements a provision, a definition of the cultural heritage institutions that could use the provision, uh, an exception to the reproduction right for the purpose of preservation, and a specification of who could access the preservation copies. The provision would be very easy to draft. In fact, we could draft two of the three parts by the end of this hour. We could take language directly from the article from Article 6 of the EU Digital Single Market Directive. The third part, specifying the conditions of access to preservation copies, would admittedly be a little more complicated because there are more choices, but the expert would be able to figure out how to handle this issue, perhaps by giving the country several options to choose from. As Stephen indicated, uh, many countries in the developing world do not have adequate preservation exceptions. A model provision endorsed by WIPO would, one, signal to government, to national governments, the importance of this issue, and two, provide a clear way forward. A model provision might not be able to resolve, resolve all cross-border issues, but it could help overcome the inertia that is preventing action in this area. Every day that goes by, more of our cultural heritage is lost. You have the ability to take action that would help us fulfill the mission to fulfill our mission of preservation. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Well under time. And now um, I've reset the clock. And now we have next on deck is Teresa Hackett. So Teresa, go pitch. Well, thanks very much, um, everybody. And good afternoon, dragons. My name is Teresa, and I'm a professional librarian. Dragons, the COVID crisis has shone a bright light on an education crisis. When lockdown happened in March, people everywhere relied on digital content for education, entertainment and creativity. Demand for online library services soared. For example, in one European country, public libraries saw take up of e-learning and language courses increase by 450% and e-books by 300%. In response, the government invested €400,000 to satisfy the new demand during COVID. But the prospect for continued public funding at this level is dire. Why? 
because of price and license conditions. First, libraries cannot simply get ebooks off Amazon like individuals. In a public library, an ebook costs an average three times more than the printed copy. Second, libraries don't buy ebooks, they rent them for a limited time and a limited number of simultaneous users. So the license has to be renewed and paid for over and over again. In the university sector, some publishers even refuse to sell e-versions of their textbooks to libraries. Why? Because their business models are built around direct sales to students. When they are available, they're unaffordable. For example, one textbook priced at $32 for the print version costs $66,000 for one user license lasting 365 days. For other examples, check out hashtag ebook SOS. Titles are also restricted for use by specific restricted cohorts of students. And here the prices are hundreds or even thousands of times more than the print title. And again, must be paid for every year for students. So distinguished dragons, this is a public policy issue. <laughs> These licensing practices discriminate against poorer students and they harm education and research. At the root of the problem is the monopoly created by copyright law. Libraries have no choice but to pay extortionate prices or not buy the ebooks at all. It is a clear case of market failure. Remember the Statute of Anne, the world's first copyright law, an act for the encouragement of learning. Well, what happened there? Digital should make access more equal, more fair, but the opposite is true. So Dragons, this is a global problem. We need assistance from WIPO. SCCR should investigate the ebook market and propose measures to deal with anti-competitive practices. It should also promote the development of OERs by governments as a long-term solution to the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. 2.57, well under three seconds under three. And now uh, I have reset uh, my clock and we have our final contestant, Jean, uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, respected judges, my colleagues have stressed the need for various actions to, to make meaningful progress toward limitations and exceptions to support libraries, archives and museums and education and research. I want to turn the question upside down and ask what happens if WIPO does not take action to advance these agenda items? Bad things will happen if this gap in the copyright system is not filled. First, we already know from the studies by professors Cruz and Seng that exceptions in national copyright laws range from robust to none and everything in between. If WIPO does not step forward, the vacuum will be filled by ever more divergent national practices. Second, without adequate exceptions, libraries, archives, and museums risk infringing copyright simply to fulfill their fundamental mission to preserve their holdings and make them available for research. They face two hard choices, either limit service to their users out of fear of infringement, or resort to workarounds to circumvent copyright, such as taking a risk management approach instead of strict copyright compliance, and thus undermining the international copyright system. Either choice inevitably has a direct impact on research and education. Third, the pandemic has taught us that global and digital are the watchwords, not just of the present, but for the future. Issues such as cross-border access must be addressed at the international level. Only WIPO can do that. WIPO's mission is to lead the development of a balanced and effective international IP system. Only an international instrument can establish a consistent level of exceptions globally to ensure that our cultural heritage can be preserved and made available for research and education. So time's up. It's now time for SCCR to begin text-based work to move this agenda forward in a bold and innovative way. Failure to do so will perpetuate increasingly divergent national laws, a weakened and disrespected copyright system, and limited ability to support preservation, research, and education across borders and around the world. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jean. Um, I will reset the clock and 
uh, actually, um, now this first stage is uh, completed. Uh, now we start the lightning round where each judge is given one minute uh, to pose questions to any contestant. And uh, I'll give, I'm gonna ask the contestants to turn on your cameras just so we can see everyone again. And I think I'll give you about 20 to the judges about 30 seconds more to compose their thoughts. And I will go in reverse order of introduction. Uh, so judges, I will go in this order. Anna, Luis, Santiago, Eri, and Inca. And um, um, we'll go with, like Anna, if you're ready, we can go with you first. And um, yeah. Okay, uh, good afternoon from my part. Uh, thank you very much to all of you who pitched your ideas. Um, I made some careful notes. Uh, I took, took uh, everyone into consideration and I, I kind of pointed, gave, gave points on the basis of, of clarity and then common interest, basically from my own part, because I, I uh, of course, I'm here in a personal capacity, so not representing Finland or representing even uh, EU or any for, uh, official format. So, but I really liked all of, all of these pictures, but most, I think, um, pictures uh, one and two, I think were very feasible, I think. And um, basically, you know, to have any code basis for- Sorry, Anna, to for, um, I think there's, there's a sound, is there a sound, or people experience some, some sound issues? So maybe- Oh, sorry, I don't, don't, don't know what- uh, uh, yeah, is that better now, Anna? Like, can, could you please? Uh, sorry, uh, I, I I have I don't know I don't know. It it sometimes I have problems with the with the Zoom. So um, yeah, you know I think we all but, it's but, good now. Uh, yeah, much better. Yeah, so so Zoom is somehow you know I I already today had to change platforms once because of two Zoom. So sorry about that. Anyway, so they, yeah, so of course, uh, first uh, pitch was, uh, uh, from my point of view, perfect, because I really believe that it's, um, you know, that would be from my own perspective, the first thing to do to, to put uh, disabled uh, people on the same level uh, with each other, of course. Um, and then the, the issue about transparency in, in the, in the copyright system, I think it's a very, very uh, good point. And only, only here, uh, I would like to just kind of ask uh, what uh, way this introduction would happen. I mean, what, what kind of way would you see this happen in the SCCR because of the nature of, of being a, a normative agenda? So normally, the the, the work there. Um, but but otherwise, I think. Um, all of you scored really well, and and I hope, of course, um, I'm, yeah, that's maybe maybe I took the minute already. Don't know. Come don't back worry. later. The sound <laughs> issue was uh, a part of it, so don't worry. It's there. Uh, now uh, we turn to Louise. Can you please unmute yourself? And we love to hear your thoughts. Well, uh, well, first of all, thank you to, to all uh, those pictures who, who brought these uh, great ideas. I, I agree with them all. So uh, that, that's to start. Uh, maybe we'll, uh, we should start asking for a, an additional SCR. Uh, on, on, on terms of, of what I think it's, is more feasible and easier to, to achieve, uh, I agree with the, the previous judge that is the disabilities is, is a low hanging fruit and uh, it, it should be a no brainer that uh, the CCR should continue and, and finalize the, uh, the, the the inclusion of all persons with disabilities. So I think that this is excellent. And also I, I, I agree with the, 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 the transparency uh, proposal from uh, uh, James, uh, which it, it is very similar to the Brazilian proposal on, that was put forward 
you know, a, a couple of years ago to see how did the, the copyright system work with relation with the, uh, the you know, the authors and, and, and relation with platforms and so forth. So, so I, I see this will complement and uh, looking uh, into uh, uh, more detailed uh, specific uh, points. So the, the question to, to, to James, you know, on transparency, uh, will uh, uh, this proposal uh, refer only to functional copyright or also to normative copyright? Because we know that it's a huge issue on transparency and how loving uh, process uh, works with regard to norm setting. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and finally, uh, uh, how many seconds I have? Um, 10 more seconds. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and, 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 and also, I think that this is, is, is very uh, compelling, the, the, the proposal of Jonathan, in, in the sense that uh, because we don't have normative work in the short term, we, we should uh, have you know, a guidance to WIPO to, to, to prepare the, the model provision, and, but not only limited to you know, to, to what Jonathan is, is proposing uh, preservation, but it, it should work on, on the key uh, issues being discussed in the WIPO exceptions agenda and uh, other topics. And I stop there uh, not to... Thank, uh, thank you, Luis. Uh, and now we would go to Santiago, uh, if when you uh, can please unmute. Thank you, Santiago. Okay, okay. Thank you, Thiro. Thank you for all for the it just uh, was uh, this uh, this exercise is very uh, exciting for me because uh, all the ideas uh, are very good. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, I have uh, some notes uh, around uh, three uh, pitches. Uh, the first one is the, the uh, around the crossing boarding, uh, cross cross boarding around the uh, inspired in the Marrakesh dispositions around the uh, uh, limitation and exceptions uh, for education was very interesting for me. And uh, another one is the uh, uh, model preservation uh, uh, provision around the preservation from uh, uh, the topics around uh, cultural things was very interesting. And the, and the last one, uh, it's around the transparency uh, I am I am agree with the, with the Luis because uh, this uh, proposal is uh, very similar to the uh, Brazilian proposal uh, around the digital market and the platforms and the copyrights on the this uh, kind of uh, of uh, this uh, use of the copyright uh, uh, works and uh, was very interesting so uh, only one more thing around the uh, uh, Teresa Hackett proposal around the uh, ebook market, because uh, this is a problem uh, in this moment for uh, a lot, of, a lot of countries. For example, uh, for Ecuador, this uh, kind of uh, uh, limitation around the market, because uh, in Ecuador we don't have. Uh, a lot of uh, options around uh, to access to the uh, works, uh, for example, scientific works specific. So uh, this is uh, my point of view, my, my first point of view around all the pitches. Uh, no more. Thank you, Theo. Thank you, Santiago. Uh, now we'll turn to Eri. Um, Please unmute yourself, and uh, we'd like to hear your observations. Maybe. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Okay, uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. I don't know what, what time zone you are in. So thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm very happy, and I really love all the pictures. And just like Anna, I want to make a disclaimer that I'm not representing Indonesia's position here. But I, I take all notes, and I have a I, I can I can go very fast now for the first page. I think it's it's the lowest chance of resistance, so I give it that because it, it will be very hard for countries to actually disagree that all disabled people should actually on the same level and have the same rights. And the second page is is it, the second page is very interesting, but I have the same concerns with the other, uh, especially Anna. How are we going to fit in this agenda within a CCR mandate? Do you think it will be doable? How, how much is the how much how much of resistance will be present 
the third pitch is actually the strongest in making case point. Uh, but uh, I, I would like I would love to ask more question with regard to uh, the the real proposal. How do you actually want to move forward with the supranational instrument? Which which part of the supranational instrument? What the supranational instrument will actually take care of? The fourth pitch for me it's the most moving. You should definitely use this for your statement. If you have more than one minute in a CCR, you should ask for more time to deliver statement in a CCR. And the fifth pitch is actually the coolest one or the most innovative one. I actually think like, why don't we just do the, this kind of recreation? But I actually have a very important question here. Why copyright and COVID? Why don't you make it more general? Because copyright and COVID might be expiring very soon or in two or five or, or 10 years. Maybe an, another kind of another title for the declaration would be better, because if you take into account the time we need to negotiate something in a CCR, by the time we agree, COVID might not be existent anymore. And the sixth con uh, the sixth pitch for me is the most realistic one. It's very narrow. It's also touch upon an issue that will be very hard for countries to object, which is preservation on cultural heritage. And it's very realistic that what what being proposed is model provisions. I think. I think it will. It, uh, there is a chance if you really fight. If some countries really fight for this, uh, then consensus might, might 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 be achieved in the SCCR. On the seventh pitch, uh, I put it as. I guess this is this is also the most interesting one because it talks about digital. My question would be, how would you relate it to the other uh, agenda in the SCCR right now about copyright and the digital environment? How would you put ENL within that discussion? Do you do you think it will be best to actually move that discussion into the ENL uh, agenda? And on the eight contestant uh, eight pitch, uh, I actually just have one question. Uh, the proposal is to move on tax space, but what kind of tax that that, that you perceive should be uh, should should we focus on in the SCCR? Thank you very much. I'm sorry because I only have one minute. I think I passed the time. <laughs> yeah, but that was actually a very comprehensive iteration of every proposal. And now uh, uh, our, to our fifth or first, uh, depending on how you look at it, Dragon, Madam Inka, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Okay, thank you very much for having me here. And I would also want to put up a disclaimer to say that I am here in my personal capacity and not representing either my office or my country. And uh, I would want to say that I found the pitches quite interesting from all the, the, the contestants. Uh, they raise very uh, pertinent issues that are applied to the agenda of the SCCR at the current moment. And I would want to, because of time, uh, just zero into the issues that I, I, I picked up uh, after appreciating everyone's contribution in this pitch. And to indicate that um, on the issue of transparency, I think it's quite an interesting proposal, but I think it will be helpful to help us appreciate how that can really come into the work of the SCCR beyond a mere discussion or a mere uh, research or findings of what is existing there, linking it to the copyright system itself. And then uh, on the issue proposed by Teresa Hackett on the, uh, trying to come up with um, policies or a system that deals with the anti-competitive um, nature or tendencies in the ebook market to say beyond beyond the copyright system because as SCCR most of the time our our role is to focus more on the copyright system itself to say now if we are taking this beyond copyright now taking it to the market how do we see the link between now the market what happens in the in the market and what happens in the copyright system and I would like to summarize by saying that uh, the pictures that I found uh, very intriguing for me, given the copyright, the, the COVID-19 situation that we are in and the fact that the SCCR has limitations in terms of time and even in terms of uh, how much uh, time and interaction we have with each other. I, and we don't know how long this uh, situation is going to be with us. I thought that the low hanging fruit is what, what, what we need. And I thought that um, the model law proposal by Jonathan will help us maybe to achieve um, results uh, in the short time or while we are dealing with this situation. And I also found um, the proposal by Sean on, the, on, on us sitting back and, and interrogating our copyright system and say, what is it that works for us? or that no longer serves as this at this point, point in time. Do we still need to talk about limit the copyright system to face-to-face -to -face teaching or we need to review that? I thought it was quite interesting for us to look at how we can bring the Doha declaration into the copyright system and, and bring it uh, to a time where it's relevant for us. So I thought those were quite interesting, but above everything else, I would like to 
congratulate and thank the contestants for speech, for the pitches that they submitted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nkayan. Um It's uh, 47 minutes past the hour, and we actually scheduled um, a longer time for this. So actually, what I think we can do before we start, let's say, tallying the votes, I think because all our dragons um, more or less addressed every pitch, I think it would only be fair uh, not to do a Q&A, but rather uh, have each contestant in reverse order, I would like to give you uh, 30 seconds uh, um, related to your pitch, if you, there are any things you would like to clarify or stress that you didn't, you feel you didn't uh, get a chance to. So just as a reminder, the order will be in reverse order. So it'll be Jean, Teresa, Jonathan, Sean, Stephen, Teresa, Nobre, Jamie, and Alan. So with that in mind, um, I would like to start with Jean. If Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, Ari made a very good point. I, I called for text-based work, but I didn't specify, I didn't narrow that down. And in particular, I think there are two areas. Uh, one is a preservation instrument, um, which as Jonathan said, could be done by the, you know, the end of the end of this session. Uh, and the second area is a, a draft text for a, a model law for um, exceptions and limitations, particularly for libraries, archives, and museums to start with. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Jean. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, now, Teresa, when you're ready. Yeah, so thanks very much, Dragon, for all your really helpful comments. Um, I just would have a couple of brief responses. Um, so I think my, my proposal was a very practical um, proposal and, and really helps to give information on how, on how the copyright system is working as a whole. Um, and I had questions about how would it relate to the SCCR? Well, I think my proposal would maybe complement um, in many ways the popular proposal that Jamie made at the beginning on transparency, um, because I think it could, and it could be part of a work program on transparency to see how do the, uh, how does the copyright system work? And um, WIPO has actually done work on copyright and competition before. And in a report in 2013, they stated that if markets for authorized authorized uses don't work properly, people will switch from legal to illegal copies. And it has an important um, relation for the democratic development of countries. So I think it is a copyright issue that the committee could address. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. And now we'll go to Jonathan Bannon. Just to let you know, I've been a bit generous with my 30 seconds, but please try to stick to 30 seconds. Thank you. Well, well thank you, Dragons. Uh, for your uh, your uh, response, I mean, first of all, of course, and he goes without saying that you're all very intelligent and good looking. Um, and I'd also like to add that I, I, I uh, uh, your basic intuition is correct that this my proposal is very pragmatic. It's <laughs> it is um, it is the most likely to actually you know cross the finish line. In our lifetime, and uh, you know that's saying a lot for uh, for the SCCR. Great, Jonathan. Um, Sean, you're next. Okay, great. Let me um, address the one question that I heard, which was from Ari, and let me just verify that my my proposal is not that we take years to negotiate a new declaration, but rather that SCCR agree now to undertake a course of action to act now before the COVID pandemic is over. So we can call it very various things. It could be the copyright on, you know, the declaration on, on copyright and public health emergencies or the declaration on copyright in the digital environment. But my point is that we're not negotiating anything now. And at this SCCR, what the, what the committee should agree to is to work with a timeline, with a deadline of the next SCCR to actually produce a declaration at the next SCCR. And since we're not negotiating anything else, I think we should vote to address that one issue for as long as we're under this pandemic. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Uh, let me reset the clock. Uh, yes, Stephen, are you ready? 
So th thank you, Dragons, for your feedback. And in particular, thank you to, to Eri for describing me as being moving, which has never happened to me before ever. So thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to say uh, in respect to the idea of uh, a Marrakesh Treaty for the memory of the world, this would be a complement to the model provision proposed by Jonathan, but it's our opportunity to look to the long term. Next year, we have COP26, and we have a real opportunity to show that WIPO, how SCCR, can make a real contribution to adaptation efforts. I also obviously want to support the opinions expressed by the Dragons as uh, concerning the other proposals. I believe in particular that a focus on transparency as proposed by Jamie would help before we make recommendations on subjects such as public lending rights in order to understand the situation for authors, which obviously remains a priority for all of us. Thank you. Dear, your mic is off. Uh, is, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thanks. Um, Teresa, do you want to go ahead? Thank you. So um, just to clarify, uh, what I propose is um, a mandatory instrument that sets a rule to decide which national education exception applies. So this, this instrument, which is a treaty, uh, doesn't mandate exceptions, just as a rule to decide on cross-border use. And, and this can be attached to the country where the educational establishment is located or where the communication originates, we can decide. Uh, and the condition, and this is to address concerns by global North countries, uh, is that the applicable exception, of course, must be consistent with the treaties and the, with the three-step tests to avoid foreign shopping uh, for exceptions that are not uh, treaty compliant. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Um, Jamie, um, would you like to respond? Um, th thank you. As, as transparency relates to the digital agenda, I, I think that's that's correct. There's a, rela a, a very strong relationship. I think the weakness of the di digital agenda right now is that it's about everything. And so when people segue to the digital agenda, uh, you know, they, they're not really quite sure where to start. And so in some ways, it's so broad. Uh, it, it, it's 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 hard to see what there's you know what the real mandate is there. I think that transparency is a little different frame. Uh, it's one thing I would say in favor of transparency. I, I just think people underestimate how important it is to establish in terms of good government and good governance globally that we put more emphasis on facts and evidence, and that we just be better informed about things. There's huge asymmetries between what's actually going on and what people think is going on. And there's a lot of areas where they're just, just black holes where people don't even really know. Nobody seems to know what's going on in some areas. And so it's sort of, you know, we're floundering around making policies without knowing very much. I think that the good thing about the transparency thing is that it, 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 it can go to everyone's issue in all the different areas. It's sort of a cross, a cross cutting issue. I, I think the focus should be initially the goal of identifying areas where transparency is most needed. And, and secondly, the practical measures that can increase transparency. So there should be a normative frame in the sense, the goal should be to have more transparency. And that's sort of basically something that people should be able to agree at, at that level. And finally, in terms of Luis's uh, comment, uh, I think it should also include ways of ensuring that the normative process itself is, is transparent. There were some gains made in the last eight years or 10 years on that thing. And then there was some sliding back on that. So I think that that's also important. Thank you. Thank you, JB. And uh, last but not least, uh, Alan, please. Uh... Yes, a very brief comment. Uh, uh, one comment that really highlighted is that lack of resistance to the inclusion of people with disabilities since it's already being approved it went all through the process and although there is uh it's probably the easiest issue well it's the least resistant issue within as as ccr it seems to be abandoned it seems to be just left on itself as if we had completed the job of including people with disability we have not and not only that but i do think that if we when we push for that we actually are pushing for more limitations we're actually getting a stronger hold on the importance of limitation within the whole system. Uh, all the other issues are very important, but 
they do bring resistance on their own and i do believe that pushing forward with the easiest issues will actually strengthen the the ones that are that face more resistance that's all um thank you alan uh, so i think um everyone contestants dragons and guests i think this has been an illuminating session and we could easily end here, but actually there will be one more step. Um, it'll be perhaps a bit painful, but I think it's necessary. Uh, and this is where the dragons come in. Um, I will ask each dragon um, to nominate their two favorite proposals or, and it can be based on your criteria. You don't need to explain it, just, uh, Give us two, and my colleagues in Washington uh, will, to ensure that this vote is carried uh, above board and all that, they will, you know, I'll make sure that this vote is, you know, the votes are counted and uh, we'll see about some, you know, what would be ripe to harvest. So with that in mind, because because we really know how to count votes in the United States. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's a good point. I should have other monitors. Um, but yet, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, did um, agree to help me out here. Um, I'm actually going to, because it's getting late for you, Ari, in Jakarta, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to put you on spot and ask you to uh, give us uh, two proposals. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll tell you my criteria to just to be fair. So, so, so you don't have to feel bad if you're not being, being chosen. So my criteria is uh, the, the creativity of the pitch and the practicality, which means to the probability of it actually happening within the SCCR. So if I have to pick two, and this is with no particular order, it will be pitch number five and pitch number six. Okay, so just to be, Clear, um, Ari, you said pitch number five and pitch number six. Yes, Sean and Jonathan. Okay, Sean and Jonathan. Okay, now um, I will go to Botswana and ask um, Madame Menka if you could please uh, give us your two favorite uh, pitches. Okay, thank you very much. And I would also want to share my my criteria. First, when you share the objectives, we talked about creative ways of assisting the, the upcoming SCCR to make progress given the circumstances we are in. And then uh, secondly, I also looked at the possibility of us making progress on an issue. So for that reason, uh, without necessarily having copied from Eri, I also ended up with the same, um, the same, uh, the same contestants, Jonathan and Sean. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Inka. Um, uh, now I would turn to Luis uh, in Santiago. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I, I, I love all the proposal, uh, but uh, considering the, the impact and urgency uh, that we have in one hand to start doing normative setting based on facts and not, uh, you know, and, and dark numbers, I, I think that transparency is a, is a very important uh, Pitch and we should go for it. And also, because of the the urgency and the impact uh, that will have, is I go for Sean uh, declaration on uh, on COVID and or pandemics. Uh, but in uh, thinking, this should be like a really short term basic uh, declaration to facilitate decisions in member countries. Thank you. But I love you all, guys. All, all, I go for all. Thank you very much, uh, Luis. And now I turn to you, Anna. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, I will stick with the ones I mentioned uh, previously. 
So my vote goes to one and two. And the reasons were, um, they were clear enough, I think. Um, and then um, number two would contribute, I think, to some of these issues uh, mentioned in the other pitches. Um, so, you know, regardless of the way it's done and maybe not in SCCR somewhere else, but I think the work on, on the transparency and in particular the metadata issue is very important, I think. Thank you very much, Anna. And now, uh, finally, uh, from Ecuador, uh, we would love to hear from you, uh, Santiago Ceballos. Thank you. Thank you, Thiro. Uh, it was very interesting, this exercise around uh, all of the proposals. But uh, I think that uh, proposal number six uh, has um, a good opportunity and uh, it's a good idea uh, around uh, a lot of countries around the uh, heritage and cultural uh, preservation. And, uh, uh, and the, the number of the, the proposal number five around the coronavirus is uh, so trend, trendy, I think, in this moment. But uh, my vote is for the uh, proposal number seven uh, for Teresa Hackett. It was uh, very important for me. I, I think it's very possible. Uh, Good. It's, a, it's a good proposal. It's a good proposal. Thank you. Theo. All right. Thank you. Um, just uh, give us a minute to sort of. It shouldn't be too hard, but to tally the vote. <laughs> I want to be incorrect. Uh, I'll join you in about a minute. Uh, Jonathan and, and Sean, I think uh, I collected the most votes. I think. I think that's correct. Uh, we confer I, I, I just want to point out that that the head of the organization that is running this forum somehow just happened to get the most votes. What? We, we don't want oh, you oh, I got the most votes. <laughs> Actually, I, I think, first of all, Jonathan, I think about? you you got the most votes along with Sean. Yeah, Jonathan, I hereby include in my declaration a mandate to SCCR to draft a monologue. Uh oh. Oh, we're being. Did you put. So that was exciting. Was that? <laughs> well, I removed it. So uh, whoever that, that was, was the white of spirit. Yeah, yeah. seriously. Yeah. Wow, that's that's I've, never I've never actually seen that before. Yeah, so. yeah. There's no real Zoom experience without that kind of thing happening. At least it was just weird techno music. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't very good. <laughs> and with the anonymous face, it was. Could have been worse. Predict, bit predictable. <laughs> but so my Washington DC, could you help me out here and count? Um, what do we have here on the? Uh, Jeru, on I think the we vote. should not have America's count votes. I don't know. If okay, we, we can do Brazil's votes. I don't think that's a good idea either. Let's get some. You no, know, no, but I don't know. No. You know, let's get some Swiss to do so, someone in Switzerland to do so. Maybe but, um, that would work. Or Canadians. But, Canadians are good too. Claire, what did you get? Yeah. All right, so the top two vote getters were five and six, which were Sean and Jonathan's proposals, uh, closely followed by the transparency proposal by Jamie. And and so... Oh, wow. I think... Uh, I think all the pitches were really, really uh, interesting. And uh, for me, this was, uh, I like the format of uh, people having to boil down to three minutes what the pitch is. So, yeah. No, actually, could actually, I, so could I just add yes. in the, in the, uh, in the spirit of trying not to have anybody voted off the island, that the beautiful thing about the Doha declaration is that it instructed the trips council to do things. So a, a 
declaration on this issue could instruct the SCCR to do things. And so I would be happy to include in the declaration uh, an instruction that a model law on preservation uh, be included. So what Sean's, what Sean's trying to do is SCCR say. include its transparency provisions <laughs> that Marrakesh be expanded to include all disabilities and the cross-border provision be expanded to include research and education, et cetera. <laughs> what Sean's trying to do is figure out what means for action and make it part of his thing. <laughs> and, and I would like to graciously concede that others <laughs> have, have um, won this contest and I will do my best to cooperate <laughs> and give them some transition money. <laughs> um, uh, that, that's very, very Canadian of you, Jean. Very generous. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, um, Claire, would you say that uh, we can um, wrap this show? Yeah, and be good to so I wanted, more bombing. <laughs> I want so to recount. I want to recount. <laughs> before we close, you I, live in Georgia. I I'm sure I got some votes. I'm sure I got some votes. Where are my votes? I want all the illegal votes to stop being counted now. In Ireland, we oh, have mine. a single. In Ireland, we have a single transferable vote system. So you vote for your first, and then you you transfer your vote down to the other candidate. So everybody Ray gets a vote. Ray <laughs> Ranked choice voting, yeah. That's so, yeah. You don't export that to the US, otherwise you would have like five years until the next, until we get the results there. Uh, well, can I, I ask? Uh, can I ask something? Yes. I ha I yes. have because um, yeah. So congratulations to the winners, of course. Um, but um, about the the pitch number two and the idea of metadata helping in the other pitches, for instance, for instance, in in uh, genes, uh, this number eight, the pitch where you're seeing kind of um, unwanted development, you know, uh, of copyright system, that copyright system is not working uh, properly, for example, uh, that, you know, institutions are, are forced to make some um, copyright infringements or they limit their services or they circumvent um, ways of providing content because uh, of copyright concerns. I think that's that's uh, you know something that definitely you know merits uh, work on on metadata issues because metadata um, on works and authors that are that that's uh, trustworthy helps uh, identify the the uh, st status of copyright uh, works. Uh, it helps. Um, finding right holders it helps uh, licensing purposes it makes makes uh, you know kind of even though i like uh, open access content really much i really like the, the possibility of uh, using uh, works uh, in other ways uh, you know that are assisted and, and and helped it would be also very good that you don't have to make them open you know from the start you know to provide uh, open materials but you actually could use the normal copyright protected works but the licensing of that uh, would be so easy automated um, and the remuneration would be um, directed to the right uh, recipients and and that the crediting of, of uh, you know the copyright system and the moral rights would be there um, applied as well so i mean this is i think one of these things that's that came to my mind um and what else i had 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 uh, uh well for starters but i think i mean in each you guys said so many very important things that i thought that could be you know somehow assisted by by working on on, on common principles for for uh, metadata and, and data management in, in in general supporting data Thanks. I, I, yeah, I, I think I think the uh, the issue of the metadata and the transparency together, uh, the potential to be transformative in ways that maybe are hard to appreciate now. Uh, it, it was just it was just sort of change the way we begin to think about the copyright system. I think what, one thing that for me is really a critical thing is just this, there's always this lingering idea that somehow, for example, in, in music, that performers are somehow um, not being compensated as much as uh, publishers are in some areas, or 
you know, you sort of get this idea in some of the scientific publishing. There's this question about who, you know, how much do authors get or things like that. I think that knowing more about how those things work, uh, journalism, there's a lot of, a lot of the journalists that show up at WIPO are, are concerned also about uh, these, you know, they complain about the contracts they have to sign to alienate their rights to work, but we don't really know too much about what's actually happening. We just have like these anecdotes and these stories and, you know, we're not really collecting data. Um, I know that we're, we, uh, in the patent side, we're beginning to create repositories on licenses, for example, on patent licenses we could get. We have now, almost, you know, we're, we're, we're working toward our first thousand licenses we're publishing. We're, so we're beginning to sort of try and, you know, just have more real information uh, about what's going on in these different areas. And so I, I, I think that uh, the normal split between uh, users and, and right owners is not is not necessarily going to be what you're going to see. There, there's some people that really think transparency is going to be a good idea. They could be on either side of that divide, and other people that may not not want it because they may they may think it may you know sort of go in the wrong direction. Certainly, in the enforcement side that Anna's brought up, there's uh, there's going to be some concerns by some people that lead to more enforcement. Uh, also, if you allow me to, to follow on James, I, I think it's important that the we, we, we have the information on what type of uses are the ones who are really making, you know, the living of authors. So we, we, we can craft better the type of uh, rights that we grant and we can better craft exceptions uh, that are important. Uh, also, the, the issue of enforcement is, is very important in, in the sense that we, we see there is a lot of uh, and transparency on how collecting society works in many parts of the world, and, and maybe if when we have more metadata, we will be able to 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 follow to see who is uh, misusing the, the the money of the artist. So I think this uh, for the artist will be very useful. And if if I meet you, just yes, two minutes. Please. Uh, to, to follow up and, 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 and to, again, I'm not trying to justify my, my choice. I, I stick with five and six. Well, actually, I have to also say that, like, like I said in the lightning, lightning round, that uh, James' proposal was actually very interesting and important. This is the most interesting and important. But then what, what I was imagining is that the agenda of the SCCR is very packed and the proposal is a permanent agenda. So there will be a lot of crying foul if you try to push broadcasting and exceptions and limitation and, 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 and you include a new, uh, a new permanent agenda. That's why five and six is actually very interesting because Son and Jonathan has actually make it make a very good point in their pitch that we are not trying to create new treaty. We are not, we're not even trying to amend any treaty, but we just give a more clarification, right? Uh, I, I think the, the US is to define and give more clarity to how we interpret the treaty that is already exists. This is a very easy way out. And actually, and actually it's, it, it is, this actually will, will better to wrap some of the exceptions and limitations agenda that it will make room <coughs> for a new permanent agenda that, that needs to be discussed in the SCCR. Thank you. Sorry, if, if I can uh, comment on Aries. Uh, uh, I, I think that the, the issue of transparency, it fits very well within the existing digital you know, content uh, agenda item. So, so, it's, so maybe it, it's a matter of how you implement that. And within that existing agenda item, we include specifically some transparency questions that we will have to define to be more important. Uh, and also, I think it's completely agree with the, with the the declaration will be very useful you know, on, on pandemic to, to guide on this urgent moment. Thanks, uh, Louise. Um, so I think, uh, you know, thank you all our dragons and contestants. Not only was it a fun exercise, but I, I really do think that it uh, sort of helped us move beyond maybe some of our conventional thinking to uh, think about some tangible uh, outputs for our work program over the next year or two. So with that, I would like to thank all of you. And uh, Claire, I just wanted to ask Claire just to confirm this event was recorded, yes? Correct, this event was recorded and we'll post it on YouTube later. So if you'd like to refer back or send it to others, uh, you're welcome to. And maybe it'll be edited a bit to, in to edit out that well our visitor but you know. <laughs>
decent <laughs> happen, I guess. Uh, but with that, I wanted to thank you all uh, from, you know, all, you know, I know that there are many time zones involved um, from Santiago to Jakarta uh, to Gavaron. So thank, thanks all of you. And Claire, would you like to um, put the whatever, what, I've heard it referred to as the kill switch. 